I would love to introduce Tim, who is a local artist and photographer. Um, I'll hand over to you, Tim, to introduce yourself. Oh, thank you very much for the introduction, Claire. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, spending your Monday night with us here. And thank you to Tower Hamlets Cemetery Park, well, friends of Tower Hamlets Cemetery Park for inviting me to the talk. Um, and yeah, they kind of link in with the work that I did during lockdown. So yeah, I was really thrilled when they reached out to me to ask me to host this talk as it, yeah, it's obviously very appropriate. And um, it's one of my favorite outdoor spaces in London. So yeah, great to be here. Um, I'll just, yeah, talk a little bit about myself and my background very quickly. Um, yeah, I am Tim. I'm a photographer slash artist and also a working uh, picture editor. Um, sorry, I'm just admitting some people. Um, yeah, I, I kind of work as a part-time picture editor and I guess my photography kind of falls into documentary photography, uh, which is where my COVID-19 plant print project fits in. Um, and yeah, I graduated from the London College of Communication at the end of last year, studying photojournalism and documentary photography. Um, and the COVID-19 plant print project is one of my first projects out into the real world, if you like, um, even though it was in obviously a very strange time during lockdown. Um, I shall talk about that a little bit later. Um, first of all, I'll go through sort of the history of antitypes, which is, you can call those plant prints antitypes. I'll probably use those interchangeably throughout the talk. Um, and then I'll go through an overview of the antitype process in kind of a broad sense, uh, talk about the project, the ideas behind it, uh, kind of how it links in with, uh, I guess, mental health and well-being. Um, and also towards the end, go through an equipment list. So if you want, do want to make your own antitypes at some point, this will, I'll give you, I guess, some tools to do that. Not kind of literal tools. I can't send out kind of things, obviously, but um, I guess like a list if you like. And then I'll do a quick show and tell as well, uh, how to make an antitype. It won't be like a really full in-depth thing just for the issues of time as antitypes take potentially days to make. And yeah, I don't think you want to be on a Zoom call with me for five days. I th yeah, that won't be very pleasant for anyone, I would say. Um, and then towards the end, yeah, we'll do a Q&A if people have any questions about anything uh, I have said. Um, bear with me while I share my screen as I have a presentation. So just take a minute. Hopefully you can all see a slide now, I'm hoping. Um, okay. Here we go. So yeah, I, like I said, I'll talk a little bit about the history of the antitype, but it links in with the history of photography as well, which I'll kind of I try and breeze over as much as I can. Um, but also it's kind of, I think it's quite interesting how antitypes do fit, does fit into the early days of photography. So in terms of early photographic processes, um, Nisipur, Nis, Nipsa, sorry, my French is not the best, so apologies in advance if I mispronounce anything. Um, yeah, he created what we kind of recognize as a, one of the very first photographs in, um, so I'm just playing my screen still. Yeah, in sort of 1826 and 1827. Um, and, and yeah, it took um, the first one, like an hour of exposure time was required. And it's, uh, it's a heliographic image, um, which didn't stick around in terms of photographic practice uh, for, much longer after that, but it was kind of, it was very important that it was what we recognize as kind of the first photograph because during the early days of photography, there was a lot of people, I guess, competing uh, and also competing slash trying to help each other out um, in terms of trying to create a stable photographic process as it's something that had been known about for, in, since the 1700s in terms of the chemical processes, but um, uh, it, it took quite a while to kind of get to this point where we actually ha had an image. Um, Sorry, my computer's just slightly being erratic. Um, and yeah, probably of more significance is a, a person called Louis de Guerre, who uh, was an associate of Nipsa. And he went on to develop what is known as the daguerreotype, which I, if you're really into photography, you've probably heard of a daguerreotype as it was probably like the first photo photographic process that kind of became public publicly available. And a lot of the early stuff from the early days of photography that you may have seen in exhibitions online are of the daguerreotype. Um, and yeah, there's, I think one of the first photographs of Abraham Lincoln is a daguerreotype. If you Google it, I'm sure it will come up and you have to see it. And it took only minutes of exposure in terms of, um, in, instead of eight hours. So it, it, it really helped kind of 
give photography a, le a leg up and, and help it produce kind of clear, finely detailed, finely detailed results as well. Um, but in competition at this time was uh, William Henry Fox Talbot, who is a, a British person. Um, uh, you, again, if you're a fan of photography, you, you've probably seen his work. There's been exhibitions on him in the last, I think, few years in London. Um, and he kind of did lots of, I guess, kind of landscape-esque photography um, images. Um, but his uh, process was slightly different in that it was kind of a paper-based calotype negative process. Uh, also called the Talbot type, so it was different from the Gera type, um, and th those two kind of, I guess, egged each other on in a weird kind of way. Um, but the, the thing about uh, Talbot is that he, he, um, I, I think he patented it, his idea. So if you did want to use this Talbot type, uh, you had to pay him. If you were like an amateur photographer or professional photographer, um, whereas the Daguerre type. Um, was kind of freely available um, and the French government, I think they made it available as a tool for everyone to use. Um, so therefore it kind of took off in a way that uh, the Talbot type did not um, because essentially because Talbot was like relatively selfish in, in sharing his process. Um, although I can understand where he's coming from because he uh, spent thousands of pounds uh, over decades trying to get this process. But um, so he wanted some money, but um, yeah. It, it kind of it really held him back ultimately and held back some people say photography um in a broader sense because yeah he was just not sharing his findings um as freely um and this brings us on to sir john frederick william herschel who was um yeah a brilliant person and he yeah was just like a incredibly incredibly intelligent inventor who was a polymath mathematician very well known as an astronomer, chemist, inventor, experimental photographer, which is where he fits in today, and botany enthusiast, where, which also fits in with what we're talking about today. And he helped coin the snapshot, the, the, excuse me, he coined the term photography itself, and also the phrases negative pos and positive. And he was, yeah, very, as such a brilliant inventor and a chemist, he, he was kind of around in the 1820s and 30s, really sharing like a lot of his wisdom with the photographic world, in including the people that we've referred to um, in the previous slide. Um, and he's the first person to actually fix a, photograph, a photograph in 1839, which he, um, I think he talked to William Fox Henry Talbot about. And he discovered the cyanotype, which um, a lot of you, I guess, if you're here today, you may be familiar, familiar with cyanotypes. They're kind of those uh, very deep Prussian blueprints, um, which are similar to antitypes in many ways but there's key differences, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and yeah, like I said, he's a key player in the photographic process, including the pause, dramatic pause, the antitype. I'm just gonna leave that on there as I like a nice big sparkly glittery gif to put in my presentations every now and again. Um, so yeah, they're also called, at the, um, excuse me, struggling, struggling to talk today. Uh, they're also called Herschel's flower essence prints at the time. And he had, a, I think, a very intense summer in sort of 1839, 40, 41, uh, where he yeah, dedicated like a good year or at least that summer to uh, this antitype process and, and doing hundreds of experiments with uh, how light reacts with plants. And this was, in a way, his quest to discover color photography. So which is quite remarkable, given that this was 1840. Um, so, so it's kind of thinking way ahead when, you know, color photography didn't really kind of come into prominence until, I guess, the 1900, early, mid 1900s at some point. Um, and he used, yeah, plants that were accessible to him in his uh, Kent garden uh, in Hawkehurst, uh, which is, yeah, if you want to create antitypes, it's a very good place to do so because it's one of the sunniest uh, places in Britain, I believe. Um, and the sun and UV rays are very key to creating antitypes, as we'll talk about shortly. Um, and yeah, he kind of, in this paper that was published in 1842, this big landmark paper in the world of, kind of in the world of photography, but particularly in the world of antitypes, uh, he dis disclosed that the antitype process and the, effects that, uh, and the effects the sun has on paper coat with flower juice, with, with flower and plant juices. Um, yeah, and, oh, excuse me. And other pioneers of antitypes include Mary Somerville and only August Vogel. Uh, in fact, uh, as more has been discovered about the history of photography and antitypes, Mary Somerville uh, 
is essentially the inventor of anthotypes and did a lot of work in the late 1830s, um, but was not allowed to publish her paper as uh, she was a woman. And uh, it just, yeah, that kind of thing did not happen in those days. So Herschel, to his credit, did credit Mary Somerville in his papers with his finding as she did like a lot of the legwork before uh, Herschel did kind of this uh, big uh, publishing of his paper. Um, and yeah, Mary Somerville, also a brilliant person. And in fact, I only discovered this yesterday, um, if you're into your quite interesting facts, uh, the word scientist was coined for Mary Somerville. Um, until then, that word did not exist. It was just used, I, I think different phrases were used like a professor of science or something like that. But yeah, she was the original scientist in many ways. Um, and yeah, so anthotypes kind of in this discovery use plant prints to try and introduce colors into photographs. Um, and Herschel's interest and passion in both botany and photographs uh, kind of collided. Uh, so kind of, yeah, 20, 30 years of, of, of guess thought in his head and these kind of two worlds collided. Um, and in this paper, this kind of is quite a very, quite a good summary of what an anthotype is. I'll just read this out. It says, the action is positive. That is to say, light destroys color either totally or leaving a residual tint on which it has no further or very much slower action. And thus has affected a sort of chromatic al analysis in which two distinct elements of color are separated by destroying the one and leaving the other outstanding. There we go, very well put. And this is one of his early creations, Antitype 4 from 1839, the Royal Prisoner. As you can see, it's like a very faint, uh, image um, as like a lot of antitypes are as they are kind of an impermanent unstable process but it's remarkable that I believe this must this is still around um, so even though they 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 are prone to fade um, that this is still is in existence in uh, today is is quite surprising or potentially in existence at least it, it did last decades and decades um, so let's put it that way um, yeah, so moving on a little bit from the history of, uh, this is one of my early attempts at an anthotype for a project that I did last year now, 2019. It, 2019 feels like about five years ago now, so I'm really struggling in, with the concept of time generally um, because of all that's happened this year. Um, and yeah, this is a, a, I won't talk about this too much, but this is a project on LGBTQ plus spaces in London. Um, that was in reaction to the fact that's 58% uh, of spaces between 2006 and 2016 uh, disappeared, kind of LGBT spaces disappeared. And this was a project that was, yeah, made in reaction to that. And Candy Bar was, I, I think, a lesbian bar in Soho. And I use this as a, as a vehicle, if you like, because the images do fade and change and unstable, which was kind of, kind of mirrored by the, the LGBT uh, environment of, of that era. So that was one of the reasons why I use the process. Um, but it really helped, yeah, familiarize. It was, it was great fun kind of learning this process from scratch in a weird way and, and, and yeah, really getting into it and kind of has influenced what I've done since. Um, and yeah, these are another two prints from that project. Uh, and yeah, I even used a poem, which is found on the wall of Derek Jarman's house in Kent, for those of you who know Derek Jarman's work. Um, but it shows that you can play with the process in, in different ways. So yeah, I use text on the piece of paper um, and it, there's a very faint outline of, I think some purple sprouting uh, broccoli, I think from memory. Um, yeah. So yeah, as, as kind of, as I've uh, alluded to, it is a very, it is an imper impermanent, unstable process. Uh, and what I mean by that is that it can't be fixed like a uh, regular photograph. Um, so like in a, in kind of a classic kind of film photography process, uh, which uses all manner of chemicals, um, at certain points you kind of, the photograph is fixed by putting it in a, in another chemical and therefore it becomes like a stable permanent image. Um, I, I don't have all the technical details of exactly what they entail because, um, it's, um, I, I basically did terrible in chemistry at school. So I'm, yeah, I'm not very good at that side of things, but, um, yeah, anthotype is is inherently unstable, so um, it will always continue to develop, if you like. Um, every time it sees UV light, it will slowly change and slowly evolve. Um, and for, so I guess that's one of the reasons why it is, I was going to say seldom used. Um, it's not used 
I guess kind of in a wider public sense, but I know it has it does have its has its fans, and uh, I guess is popular with some artists. Um, and it, it feels like it's it's had like a little bit more, little bits more of a resurgence in recent times. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's still not used all that much, I would say. Um, and yeah, the process. I'll give like a brief overview of this. Um, as yeah, probably haven't got into it as much as I should have perhaps by now. Um, so you take uh, something from the botanical world or a vegetable or something that grows on the ground. It can be um, it can be beetroot. It can be a daffodil. Um, obviously, some things work better than others, but I'll use an example of a beetroot, I guess. Um, so you can take the leaves of the beetroot, then uh, chop them up, uh, put them in a uh, like a mortar and pestle, and um, extract the juice from this. And then you can use that juice to kind of paint onto uh, normally sturdy kind of paper or art card, or you can even paint, paint it onto uh, kind of organic cloth or something like that. And that, yeah, and that kind of dye, uh, yeah, goes goes onto the paper. And then you place an object on top of that, and then expose it to the sun. And then the sun's UV UV rays react with kind of the plant juice that is on your surface, and then it will kind of, um, in a way, blast away kind of what's hidden. Well, what what is not hidden? Sorry, by the objects on your paper, uh, kind of like a silhouette almost effect. If, that, if it's kind of like a contact print, if any of you are familiar with uh, contact printing, um, yeah. And there's um, a lot of variables in regards to uh, anthotypes as well in in, in how they work. Um, so they are susceptible to heat. So my understanding is that the warmer the climate is, the warmer that your environment is. Uh, the faster the process will take. Um, yeah, I should start by saying that uh, antitypes aren't like cyanotypes, which take normally matter of like five, 10, 20, half an hour at most. Um, whereas antitypes can take anything from two hours to two months. Um, and it depends on all these variables. Um, and yeah, he's probably not the, 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 the most important one, but it, I have, I did notice during lockdown that it, it did have an effect like more than I thought. Um, light is absolutely the key one. So uh, it needs UV rays for this process to actually work. Um, so the more UV rays you ha have, the quicker it will be. Um, so obviously that's um, linked into time of year. So if you do an antitype in the middle of summer, like I was starting to do when I was winding down in June and we had some really nice days, I was able to do some almost in an afternoon, which is like unusual for antitypes, but Broadly speaking, they took, yeah, two, three, four days. Um, another important uh, thing is uh, what plant or botanical item that you use. Um, so some in, that you use in terms of the emulsion that is, so in terms of the dye that you're using. Um, so yeah, like something like beetroot, I keep referring to that as it's like a, one of the, if you wanna start doing antitypes, like a beetroot is kind of one of the best ones you can do in my opinion. Um, that normally takes about two days, um, again, depending on all the other factors, but it's, it's a particularly fast one to do and it reacts with the UV rays uh, really well. Uh, something like red cabbage, which can create like a really beautiful kind of purpley blue hue about it. Um, that requires like a bit of patience, particularly if you're at like a slower time of year or the weather's crap. Um, and yeah, I, I found that, yeah, some of my, my red cabbage ones took two, two and a half weeks. And even then some of them didn't turn out great. Uh, it could depend on the pulping process. So like how you extract, I guess, the juice from vegetables. Um, I'll show you some behind the scenes uh, photos of that process in a bit, as that will help you, I think, kind of visualize uh, what the process entails a little more. Um, additives use. So sometimes I add uh, alcohol, uh, kind of like clear alcohol. So something like uh, vodka or gin even, or even kind of, uh, alcohol you can buy off Amazon, like industrial strength stuff. So stuff you definitely should not drink, essentially. Um, and the, yeah, a few drops of alcohol can help speed up that process a little bit more. Um, though I think the effect is normally a bit subtle. And also an important point is uh, what kind of paper and material you use. So yeah, if you are going to create some of your own antitypes, uh, absolutely use something that's organic in nature. Um, yeah try not to buy paper that's kind of covered in chemicals as that all kind of interfere with the reaction, I, I suppose, unless that's what you're after and, and that's what you want to do. But generally speaking, it's, a, it's, it's better to have something that is 
organic and use and I was using relatively thick kind of art paper as well so 160 GSM if that means anything to anyone I don't know um, but yeah that kind of having that sturdy paper sort of really helped absorb absorb the 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 juice and the dye uh, whereas if you use kind of I don't know just regular A4 paper it, it kind of like slides off the surface a little bit and it's yeah it's not nearly as satisfying and the paper uh, can like crumple up and fold as it gets wet so yeah the thicker kind of paper the better generally I find um, I haven't experimented with cloth that much but there's something that I would love to uh, do at some point but it just didn't feel quite right for the, this particular project I was going for consistency um, excuse me while I take a swig of tea yeah um, so COVID-19 plant prints I guess that's uh, why you're here this is a project that I started uh, during lockdown um, so I'm just going to play with my screen uh, for a quick second as um, Sorry, I just, I just couldn't see my face. Um, so I was just seeing I was still there. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, this is a project that I, uh, yeah, started, I think it was the first week of April. Um, so that's when obviously things started to, well, things had already been like uh, just out of control for like a couple of weeks in terms of coronavirus. And yeah, the impact of our lives was obviously monumental. Uh, and yeah, I feel like at that point in time, I needed something to focus my energy on. Um, and sorry, I'm, I'm very, just need to fill on my screen again, apologies. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, it was obviously a, a, a very strange time for all of us. Um, and I needed something to, yeah, something hands-on, something that wasn't kind of, staring at a computer screen, staring at the television, being away from the myriad of phone alerts that were kind of obviously quite generally quite scary, I think, for, for a lot of us. Um, just um, there, was, there was something that was happening like every hour, it felt like it, it, it was just a, like a, a tsunami of bad news and feeling overwhelmed. Um, and just and also just because everyone's really curious as to what was happening at the same time, because you wanted to be on top of the latest breaking information and, and like what, what you should be doing and all, all these kind of very basic human things. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of always felt like I had some unfinished business in regards to amphotypes with the previous project that I mentioned from 2019. And it just popped into my head one day, like I all of a sudden have all this free time as well um, because it's free time isn't something I've had a lot of um, until lockdown, had like quite an intense a few years with regards to other like photography work or, or my uh, MA it was quite an intense experience. Um, so yeah, I was all of a sudden left with this kind of chasm of free time, which is uh, in some ways great, but also daunting when you have all this kind of existential threat and dread and, 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 and the, the, the things that I mentioned before. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of, it was just an instinctive thing. I, I just started creating some images, just a few, just to see if I could almost still do it. Um, but then I, I kept sort of doing more and more and more. It became like a, a regular thing when I had my, my days off from my other work, because I was kind of like working part time. Um, and all my other freelance kind of work fell off a cliff. So it's um, all this kind of uh, all this time. Um, it felt like, yeah, it was launching some constructive exposure. Um, and yeah, in the end, I did, I think, 147 from. very very restricted as we all were to our local environment um because obviously for the highest lockdown that first six seven eight weeks uh you're only out like allowed outside for between half an hour and an hour each day for your exercise and i kind of worked that into the idea of the project so when i when i went out on my kind of 
kind of daily walks, occasionally a run, but let's face it, it was generally kind of just walking. Um, I, yeah, I kind of explored my local surroundings. I was picking up um, various plants and objects um, from uh, various, from parks around me, including obviously Tao Hamlet Cemetery. I kind of rediscovered that location and how vital these outdoor spaces uh, became to a lot of people, um, particularly in an urban environment in London where a lot of people don't have garlands, don't have that kind of privilege and luxury. And these outdoor spaces became like something that was enormously uh, beneficial to kind of our well-being and mental health. And yeah, just being outside for during that time was kind of uh, important as well. Um, so yeah, these are the, all these plants that I picked are from uh, a mixture of places, uh, from Tower Hamlet Cemetery to the Olympic Park, that's like a bit further, but I could get there and back in an hour. Um, Victoria Park, uh, I also live very close to Mile End Park as well. Um, and even like occasionally I just picked up leaves off the street around me, just like, yeah, trying to be resourceful, I guess. Um, and as lockdown kind of, I guess, opened up a little bit and we were allowed to be out, out a little bit longer, and also I got my bike fix. Uh, we were allowed to kind of, I was allowed to go like a bit further afield. So as, as it came to like print 100, 110, 120, which are some of these at the bottom, uh, these are like from, from slightly further afield, like some of them are from Wanstead. I think um, some of them are from, I think near Tottenham Hale along that canal, that's a cycle up there. Um, so it's kind of interesting that, uh, yeah, they, they kind of like changed, the project evolved as lockdown evolved. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and yeah, I'll show you just going to the next slide, show you a couple of examples. Um, so the one on the left is um, of an impression of a uh, meadow buttercup leaf. Um, and it is made from a beetroot stem emulsion. So I purchased uh, many, many beetroots over the course of that eight weeks uh, from my very, very local independent shop. And that was another, I guess, restriction in terms of like, actually going to shops and that kind of thing. Um, luckily I have like a good local independent store, which um, was open all the time, um, but I could only go there at certain points because you're only allowed out, I think once a day then. So that was just another little uh, thing to think about. Um, yeah, so, uh, and yeah, this one I think took, looks like it took four days to make and this is print 32. Um, and this was picked from, I picked these two because they're both from Tower Hamlet Cemetery. Uh, so this is essentially like a weed leaf, if you like. Um, and I try to be, in terms of the botanical items that I was using for prints, I try to be as uh, resourceful as I could and not, and be as, I was going to be as destructive as I could. That's the opposite of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> trying to not to be destructive in terms of the items that I was uh, picking. Um, as, as obviously, you know, I don't want to go around my local, local area and kind of, destroying nature as that will kind of defeat the purpose of the project. Um, so yeah, I use a lot of weeds, although I did for this one on the right hand side, I did a pick a daffodil from the Tower Hamlet Cemetery, but it was one that was definitely on its way out and, and, and kind of wilting and dying. Um, as yeah, daffodils, I think were in full bloom in early to mid April. Um, and obviously there's so many in the cemetery, but yeah, I kind of waited until it was definitely definitely kind of looked quite sad, but because it was quite wilty, it kind of worked quite well for the print in a weird way, as if, if they're too kind of rich, uh, and there's kind of almost too watery, and then you can create, it can kind of make it, make a bit, oh, excuse me, make a bit of a mess of a print as well. Um, and the emulsion for this was uh, baby, baby spinach, um, which was again bought from my store. Um, in fact, quickly going back to the beetroot one, uh, this was, I used beetroot stem as, to, as opposed to the actual beetroot bulb, I guess that's the word. Um, so it was interesting that I could make this one without, uh, it, was, it was very, very sustainable. So it was, the beetroot stem is obviously not something that you eat at all. Uh, so it's just like the offcuts of beetroot. Um, uh, you can use the beetroot bulb, but they're, they're, it's very hard to kind of extract juice from because obviously it's so solid. You have to really like put a lot of work in a, in a blender and then boil it. But beetroot stem, you can just like, cut it off. I was very lucky that the store sort of sells the beetroot in the stem and leaves kind of all pouring out of, of this uh, bulb. And the beetroot stem actually creates like a really lovely bright pink hue as well, which you can see there. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, the one on the left is uh, 
a red cabbage emotion. And I know I alluded earlier to a uh, red cabbage like taking a long time. And yeah, this one took 10 days, even though it was uh, excellent weather. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if people recall, I'm, sh I'm sure you do, but uh, how glorious the weather was during, I think, April and May for a lot of the time, which was obviously fantastic in terms of if you were able to get outside to actually enjoy your walks and that kind of that kind of thing. Also, it's kind of frustrating because, um, yeah, the one time we had like, I don't know, six weeks of amazing weather and we kind of we're in lockdown. We can't really do the things we normally do. But I guess in hindsight, it was quite nice because at the moment, I don't know how people are, are coping with their various situations in lockdown. It, it feels yeah, a lot more difficult because it is winter. It is darker. It is not quite so pleasant to be outside. And the fact that we've done this lockdown already is, is kind of making things that much tougher. It feels like that's yeah, that, that's kind of my perspective. Um, uh, sorry, that was a bit of a sideways distraction there. Um, so yeah, this one did take 10 days and this was picked from the, the, uh, the flower was picked from the Olympic Park and it's a California poppy um, of which there are, yeah, tens of thousands, like at a certain point, I think this was like towards mid to late April, I want to say. Um, and so I did a few of those, but this was like one of the more successful ones. And you can even see on this particular scan, there's uh, some orange kind of leaf that's kind of stuck to it as again, it was quite, I think I picked it when it's quite dewy outside. Uh, so there was, there was some water on the flower and it kind of went onto the paper a little bit, which is like one of those kind of happy accidents things, I guess, as it creates kind of, yeah, creates a, a, a nice texture about it. Um, and the one on the right is of wool barley, which uh, is kind of, I guess it's a type of grass. Um, although people, if anyone's in the chat has uh, wants to inform me otherwise about anything I've said, like, please do interject, I, I won't be offended. Um, I try to do as much research as possible, but sometimes it, it can be hard to identify certain uh, plants at times. Um, and this was with uh, Cavello Nero Emotion, which is, uh, yeah, like spinach, I guess. Um, and it's the first time I used that particular vegetable as, yeah, it was a really fun time in terms of this anthotype process because I had so much time to like really experiment with uh, what was, yeah, with, with vegetables I hadn't used before, vegetables I hadn't really heard of in terms of anthotypes. Um, and this was like one of the more positive ones as it's only took one day to make. It was like an incredibly quick reaction time. It's quite a defined outline as well. It's, it's not even like very faint. Um, and this was taken, uh, the plant itself was taken from uh, the water glaze, which is in the Olympic Park. And yeah, it almost looks like kind of a, a, a drawing, you know, like a stencil or something that's finely drawn. Um, and yeah, and another good thing about going back to the whole idea of the weather being incredible is that it made this project kind of a lot more quicker and a lot more resp uh, responsive and reactive. Um, had it been like awful weather and like at a bad time of year, it's kind of, it's difficult to make anthotypes during winter and when it's kind of cloudy all the time. So it, yeah, it's another one of those things. It just felt like a good time to be making these anthotypes. Um, and, oh, skipping ahead there. So the one on the left is uh, print number 48. Uh, this was also beetroot stem. Uh, in terms of the emulsion, but I added some port into this because I just, uh, yeah, it's when I was feeling a bit more comfortable experimenting with what was in front of me in my kitchen, I, I kind of felt like I had a grip on the basics. So I kept trying to, yeah, add in little bits. I, I think I used this quote before where I felt like a mixture between the world's worst chef and a mad scientist, just like throwing bits in from the cupboard. And um, yeah, port kind of, it slowed down the process quite a lot. So this took eight days. Um, and it's still not like the strongest print as it might even stain the paper a little bit. That's why it still retains its color. Um, but it did create like a, I, for me, this is like a yeah, really kind of deeper, richer color than the beetroot, which is quite like very kind of, if you go back to this one here, obviously that's very kind of bright, vivid pink, almost like a, yeah, not quite a baby pink, but just very bright. And this is, yeah, more of a muted kind of, kind of redder, more purpley kind of thing about it. Um, and the one on the right is also uh, has some port in it as well. And although this only took one day, apparently, which is quite surprised at, and that's the first time I've seen that. Might even be a typo. Um, but yeah, this is of uh, barren brome, which is again kind of a, a type of grass that grows near water, I believe, um, 
also from the uh, Water Glacier in Olympic Park. And the one on the left, I should point out, uh, since this is a Tower Hamlet Cemetery talk, is from Tower Hamlet Cemetery. Um, and yeah, this is one of my favourite ones as well, um, I would say. And just excuse me while I have, have a bit of tea. Oh. Yeah, the one on the left is uh, print number 68. Uh, this is, I may be saying this completely wrong, but uh, Hipsterum Dark Red Emulsion, which is, uh, it was a flower originally that just happened to bloom uh, in our living room. It's been sitting in a pot for the good part, best part of like four, five, six months. And then during lockdown, it kind of suddenly within the space of two days, just, it, it kind of always had these like huge green stems, but then the flowers just bloomed like really kind of suddenly and like it, it really impressively as well. Um, but then after a week, they kind of died and faded. And then I thought, hmm, these petals, uh, it'd be a shame to waste them. So I kind of, uh, yeah, got them into my kitchen and then like extracted the juice from them. And uh, it's really hard to extract the juice from because they were quite, quite dry and there wasn't many of them. Whereas something like spinach is like, it's like really kind of full of water and full of juice and it's, and you get a big bag of it and you can like paint for, yeah hours it feels like but this was like really hard work and like really kind of just like little just puddles of droplets trying to paint with that and then kind of mixing it with water to thin this out a bit um and it's one of those yeah I had no idea if it would even work because a lot of uh flowers and petals and botanical items just won't work for anthotypes for various reasons um so yeah I had some kind of failures and shots to the dark that didn't work but this is one that did pay off um and yeah it's again it's I know I said the other one was one of my favorite ones, but this is also, I think, one of my favorites as well, as it created like a very unusual kind of blue texture, which you don't, I guess, see so much in a natural world. And particularly when it comes to dyes as well, it's hard to get this color. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was delighted, I was thrilled when this, when this turned out to, to actually work, even though it took, I think, 13 days, it looked like. Um, and the leaf that I used for the outline is a uh, cow parsley. Uh, from Marlen Park as well. It's print 68. Uh, print 92 on the right is uh, also of cow parsley, but I think um, in a different kind of um, stage of growth. And when I say cow parsley, I mean cow parsley leaf as well, which uh, there was, Marlen Park was, yeah, full of this kind of shape, if you like, and it's a really good shape to use for anthotypes as, uh, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's got a great outline. Um, and this was a uh, beetroot stem again. I keep keep going on about this, uh, but I mixed in some turmeric in it as I was thinking of my uh, photography training and kind of <clears throat> color wheels and what colors mix with uh, other colors. And I thought, yeah, like a dark, like a, yeah, kind of a rich pink color and like a very, very bright yellow color that turmeric is. Mixing those together could create kind of like an interesting texture or color about it. And and yeah, it, again, it's in terms of color, it's one of my favorites as it kind of creates this rose gold I guess in a way kind of color and also the turmeric was like slightly gritty it made the kind of the emulsion slightly gritty so it kind of has the background has like a bit more texture towards it um as opposed to something like yeah these which are like a lot cleaner in the background um and also I sprayed like I started to experiment by spraying bits of water onto the prints as well to kind of um create some like yeah a bit more texture about them and Again, as, as I went on, it was just fun getting more, um, yeah, more inventive and just trying things out. Even like this was like a safe space to fail in a way because I had like a lot of extra time. So <clears throat> probably half of the prints that I did weren't that good or just didn't work, but half did. And then out of those, probably like 20% were like ones that were, I was kind of satisfied with, um, if you like. So yeah. Here are some uh, behind the scenes photos. Um, one on the left is that's when I, I've kind of, if you like, <clears throat> created, started the process of the anthotype and then I put them out onto my, that's my front window. And then, yeah, put them out into the sun and that's where the sun reacting with them. Uh, and the one on the right is uh, of, uh, yeah, when I'm actually creating the print. So you can see my mortar and pestle there and like a little, uh, sort of bowls of juice that I use to actually paint with ultimately. Um, and this is, yeah, <clears throat> I was fortunate to have like a little outside area. Um, and again, the weather was great. So it's like a great place to be. Uh, the one on the left is of, because once you paint them, you have to like let the prints dry. And this is just in my hallway, like out, out, out of the way of the sun. 
uh, they prob they should probably be in like a completely dark space, but because this hallway doesn't really show on this photo, it is like quite a dark hallway. It's it's an okay place for them to dry and for them not to catch too much light anyway. And the one on the right is yeah, this was con every time I came back from my walk, I was like greeted with um, these uh, plant prints in my front window, um, and I I was often like the way my house is. Uh, it gets the sun in the south of the of the house um, in the morning, and then in the afternoon the sun moves around to the front. So I found I was constantly like from about twelve to one, like slowly moving in these these prints backwards and forwards in the in these uh, picture frames, um, and then at night kind of taking them down. And um, it was often I used to get like yeah quite strange looks on the street when I was kind of shuffling these prints around all the time, which was quite amusing. Um, yeah, some weird looks. Some people were quite interested, but yeah, a lot of weird looks normally. Um, yeah, the one on the left is like, I guess, a good demonstration of how the idea of an outline works. So I think this is possibly cow parsley again. And you can see like I, where the cow parsley has been moved and you can see what's left underneath it. You can, and uh, yeah. And the one on the right, that's red cabbage, uh, which was, yeah. Another thing about red cabbage was for me, it was like really hard to do as well because it is quite thick. And yeah, it gave my arm like probably the, the yeah such a intense workout. Like uh, I'm I'm just I'm just not built for any kind of upper body strength essentially. So I'm really having to like you know smash this morsel and pestle, and then I try putting it in um, <clears throat> kind of lightly boiling it as well. But then it made it smell awful and oh yeah a big palaver. But it was in the end uh, just about worth doing it. Although some didn't really work at all, um, which is frustrating when you put so much effort into it to just like it looks terrible. Um, but yeah, some did. So it wasn't like a lost cause totally. Uh, yeah, one on the left, um, I've got a few different pots there because sometimes I used to do do them like in, in almost a batch process. Um, I was just like, yeah, good use of time. I used to spend sort of the morning, like from, I'd go for a walk maybe at nine in the morning, come back at 10 with with my def different items from different places and, and experimenting with you know, the items that I was picking then spend a good yeah a couple of hours kind of creating like these different paints uh crushing them up and then painting onto paper and then kind of logging them in my spreadsheet um and then yeah putting them in picture frames and then placing the uh the items or leaves that i found carefully um and before i knew it you know it's like yeah one two in the afternoon um and yeah this is going back to this 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 idea of i, I guess kind of uh, managing mental health and anxiety and, and that kind of thing which I'm someone that kind of suffers from anxiety and uh, I'm, we all have our coping mechanisms as I do myself and I know I as I get older I, I know what kind of works better for me obviously it's, there's no kind of magic one quick fix um, but yeah investing in this process and spending so much time kind of away from my phone and having something that was like very hands-on, very tactile and tangible. Um, you know, as I had like uh, uh, paint all over me and kind of in, in my apron and my, and my gloves and not looking at my phone, like I, I know I keep mentioning <laughs> all the time, but um, yeah, just being away from, from, from that world and just being just, yeah, being kind of present in the moment, I guess. Um, I found to be, yeah, very beneficial. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know what my lockdown would have been like had I not done this process. I think it would have, Probably, I assume it would have been tougher. Um, but yeah, it, I know different things work for different people. Um, and the one on the right, yeah, it's just another image of, of my uh, front. Uh, yeah, that's my front window again with my little cuddly toy apple there, just peeking out. Um, yeah, so I'm um, gonna spend a little bit of time talking about, I suppose, yeah, how to uh, make your own anthotype. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go kind of make, make a full one or any of that kind of thing, but I, I hopefully um, I'll give you some information that will, if you did want to make some to go, go at least you'll yeah, have a base understanding of, of the process. Um, so yeah, I have a little box of tricks here. Um, I, I know I, I, there is a, um, sorry, excuse me. There is a, a list there as well. Um, but yeah, more some pestle, in case you don't know what that is, that's one of these. I have, yeah, a run of like four of them in my house. Um, some kind of coffee filter, so yeah, or muslin cough, cloth, uh, which is good for when you have the juice, kind of making sure that you don't get bits of pulp in your bowl, like 
yeah, it just helps strains the juice. That, that's exactly what I'm trying to say, essentially. Um, so yeah, coffee filters I found were like, yeah, one of the best things to use. Um, small bowls, yeah, I don't need to show you that. I think you know what a small bowl looks like. Um, foam brush, uh, I found something like this. I hope you can all see me still. Um, I'm just gonna quickly, yeah, sure, we'll be fine. Um, Yep, uh, it's foam brush. Um, these are very, very cheap. You can get them on buy in bulk in like huge bags. Um, and they can last for probably a, a few different washes, I suppose. Um, but this is great for make, creating like a very even texture uh, on paper. Um, although th there are other methods you can like apply the juice onto paper, such as you can like dab them with uh, sponges, um, uh, any manner of things essentially. But um, this is, I, for me, I, I wanted to be have that as like a consistent thing throughout the project. I didn't really experiment too much with how I applied the juice onto the papers for this, but yeah, it's definitely something um, if, if you do get into it, there's like many ways you can, you can do this. Um, number one thing, if you do want to get into this, I would say is uh, like a good glass clip frame or a frameless picture frame. So this is uh, what it looks like, like so. Um, and yeah, I advise not to get like a really cheap one from somewhere from wherever or somewhere like Amazon, like try and get one that is glass because uh, plastic um, is, yeah, it doesn't work quite as well because it, it has a tendency to kind of, um, it's not quite as heavy. So the, the plant or leaf, or whatever item you're using might not, it doesn't go flush against the piece of paper or, always. And sometimes you even find like the, um, the plant will wriggle, wriggle around, which is, not generally what you want because it creates like a normally very hazy print. It doesn't create a very precise print. Um, so yeah, investing, spending like just, you know, a few more quid on something that is kind of more sturdy is, is, is um, yeah, my top tip in terms of actual objects that you want to use. Um, thick paper, I've yeah, kind of discovered I was using, um, I believe it's called Fabriano Tiazano. Um, I may have said that incorrectly. Um, it's essentially just like a thick art paper. Uh, which it kind of has um, a texture to it. So it kind of holds the, the juice or the emulsion um, quite nicely. Um, so yeah, it's, it's almost like card, I, I guess, but um, yeah, it's just like art paper essentially. Uh, gloves, that's kind of very important for two reasons. So when you're creating the antitype itself and you're kind of squeezing the juice into your kind of bowl and your mortar and pestle, um, it just stops, yeah, getting dye all over your hands. Like I constantly had like really kind of bright purple fingernails all the time, even though I was quite careful about it. It was just like, it, it gets everywhere sometimes, particularly if you're making, yeah, many men, lo loads of them. Um, but gloves are also, this is probably like practically very kind of a serious point. Um, if you are kind of picking wild vegetation and botanical items, um, well, number one, do your research, I would advise. So there's, yeah, still quite a lot of poisonous items out there or, or things you can have allergic reaction to. And yeah, to wear gloves for this purpose. So I, I kind of, um, I, I felt quite weird actually. Like I was going around um, places like Tower Hamlet Cemetery, kind of with my plastic gloves on. Um, yeah, just feeling a bit strange. Though I guess a lot of people were, were wearing PPE at that time. So I felt like it's maybe a little bit less weird than usual, but it was still kind of strange. Um, but yeah, there, there are there are generally like a lot of a lot of poisonous items out there. So. Yeah, pick with care. That's that's why I say. Um, then materials for emulsion. Um, yeah, that's the thing that we've gone through quite a bit. So that when I talk about that, I mean things like beetroot, spinach, things you can crush up to kind of make make your paint. Um, a lot. I haven't talked a lot about flower petals, but yeah, a lot of flower petals obviously can you can extract juice from. Uh, the reason I haven't used it loads for the project is that because is that. Um, they're costly essentially and kind of a bit wasteful as well as you need quite a lot of uh, flower petals to actually uh, get a decent amount of um, juice from it um, so yeah I generally steer, steer clear of that um, and yeah objects for the outline uh, so that, that's kind of um, things like leaves and things that I've shown before like uh, uh, I can't, I can't, my brain's gone blank again so yeah this kind of thing um, so it can be, even be grass like I've used here, bracken, ferns, cow parsley leaves. Um, yeah, anything that kind of looks like it will have a good silhouette could be a good silhouette for an outline. Um, and in fact, you can even use um, print kind of negatives, quote unquote, 
on uh, acetate paper, even though they're technically positives, if you want to get into that finer point. Um, and they create kind of more photorealistic prints. So when I say acetate paper, I mean like, essentially like almost see-through plastic in a way. So if I go back a few slides to one I created earlier, if you like. Um, yeah, this was made using acetate paper. So I kind of uh, used a picture of candy bar and then printed out uh, on a printer with the, like this see-through paper and then place it on, 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 my, uh, on my kind of art paper that kind of had the beetroot on it and then put it out in the sun. And th then it creates kind of like, yeah, this kind of very precise print. Um, in terms of other equipment, um, yeah, I, my best purchase over lockdown one was, uh, yeah, a printer that had a scanner. So I was actually finally able to like scan things instantly, which is kind of relatively important for this process um, if you want to document how the images may change and fade. So as soon as the image, I, I took the uh, frameless picture frame out from, um, out from you know, my window or wherever, uh, I, I then scan the uh, image that's created like straight away. Um, in fact, that's something I'd like to visit to see how the actual prints look now, today, as in how when they were first scanned in April, May and June. So I'm not sure some of them will have changed quite drastically, some of them not at all. Um, even though I have kept all of them out of the sun since they came in from the sun. So in theory, they shouldn't have changed too much. But yeah, there are lots of variables. So who knows? Um, and then, yeah, as mentioned before, a drop of alcohol. Um, and oh, Go about this. Yeah, so this is 90% um, alcohol, I believe, um, here, which I got like industrial shrink stuff. So stuff definitely not to drink. But um, yeah, I found this project again as I went on. I just used stuff that was on my shelf that was clear alcohol. I had some, I bought some very disgusting Icelandic gin, I think about two or three years ago, um, and in like an awful plastic bottle. So yeah, I frequently returned to that. I finally had use for it. I used it for this uh, project as opposed to drinking it because. Drinking it was not very pleasant.